Welcome back to UC University Apologetics Classics World Religion. This is part three. If you missed part one and two, please see our YouTube page and look for the playlist for UC University. The next thing we see is, don't all religions teach the same thing? After spending a few minutes contrasting Christianity with Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism, you may find it hard to believe people still assert the major world religions teach the same thing. Yet some do. This is nonsense. First, as a matter of simple observation, different religions make very different claims, and it is impossible to see how they can all be true. In fact, the nature of a truth claim is to say that one thing is true and real and valid, while another is false. Christianity teaches Jesus is the one way and that no human gets to God but through Him. Hindus and Buddhists would say all religions are equal, but deny the exclusivity of Christianity's most fundamental claim. It's nonsense to pretend that they teach the same thing. There is a world of difference between a smiling Buddha and a crucified Christ. Second, however, world religions do have some similarities on the level of morality and ethics, what it means to be good and to live the good life. Yet even here you can see there is serious variances. Buddhists understand their efforts to be the most good when they deny pain exists because it is a mere illusion. Yet Christians follow Jesus, a real man who has borne very real pain and judgment for them. Similarities in morality also dissolve upon examination. Jesus made it clear that he did not come to make bad men good, but to make dead men alive in God. Do all religions really teach the same thing? Nobody wants to give the same respect to a religion based on human sacrifice, fear of evil spirits, or mass suicide as they do, say, Zen Buddhism. Nobody seriously suggests that Hitler's claim to divine revelation should be given equal treatment with those of Mohammed or Jesus. We are only tolerant up to a point, and rightly so. Differences make a difference. So moves us on. Is Jesus the only way? So is Jesus the only way to know God, to be forgiven and saved, and to enjoy eternal life with God? Yes. As we see in Isaiah 45, 21 and John 14, 6, There is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is a hard truth for many of our friends. It is a hard truth for others who hear in a postmodern culture. Christian, we need to say this cognitively, biblically, and winsomely. But as Christian apologists, we must proclaim the word of truth. As Romans 1, 16 and 17 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. As Christians, what are the charges we need to be prepared to respond to when we say Jesus is the only way to God? First, claiming Jesus is the only way is arrogant. Here we should use arguments from Jesus' own words and the words of the disciples. We can use arguments regarding the validity of the New Testament manuscripts to point out the authenticity of the historical record. These are not our assertions. Furthermore, there are numerous other religions that make exclusive truth claims. Making such a claim does not prove its veracity, but neither is such a claim limited to Christianity. Finally, let's return to simple logic. It's not possible for all the world religions to be valid ways to God. Number two, Jesus cannot be the only way because other religions would be false. No matter what belief system you adopt, you will be saying that your system is right and the billions of people who don't accept it are wrong. If Islam is correct, the billions of non-Muslims are wrong. If Orthodox Judaism is correct, the billions of Gentiles are wrong. If it is correct to approve of multiple belief systems because they're all valid ways of achieving spiritual enlightenment, the billions of Christians, Jews, Muslims, and others who believe in exclusive religions are intolerant and therefore wrong. You can see how the logic breaks down. Number three, all that really matters is that people sincerely seek God. You may hear people say that sincerity is the most important in religions, and the rest is mere detail. It is those very details that make the difference. If you were to examine a counterfeit $50 note, it would look and feel very much like the real thing. You may even need special training to spot the differences. But it is those small but real differences that make one worth $50 and the other worth nothing. Furthermore, if sincerity were the test, virtually any delusion or sincere mental persuasion would be legitimate. Next, we turn to what about those who have never heard the good news of Jesus? Finally, what about those who have never heard of Jesus? Can they be saved? This is one of the questions that comes up in apologetics, and sometimes it's related to the question of whether Jesus really is the only way. Friends may raise this question as an honest intellectual inquiry, or they may raise it as an evasive maneuver in an attempt to evade the gospel's claim on their life. 
It will be important for you to determine how to respond to them. They are accountable to God in heaven for what they do with Jesus. As Jesus said in John 3, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. The Bible has a lot to say about this. First, all humankind is already under God's judgment because all men and women are sinful, morally accountable to God, and must give an answer to Him. Romans 1 teaches that God's infinite power and deity are evident through creation. Romans 2, 14-16 reads, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their consciences also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or ex even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Romans 3 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 40 says that no one seeks God. And Isaiah 53 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. Isaiah 64, 6 says that our righteousness, our good life before God is as filthy rags. Hebrews 9, 27 says it is appointed for men to die once and after that, the judgment. Humankind is condemned to God's judgment because of the four C's. The first is the witness of creation. Number two, the conscience within them. Number three, their own culpability in Adam and Eve in the fall. And number four, and their commission of sin personally. The next thing we see is, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord God will be saved. As we read in 2 Peter 3, 9, Romans 5, 7 through 8, 10, 13, and Joel 2, 32. He is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Next, Scripture is full of examples of men and women who trust God in faith with incomplete information, yet are saved. God's people have relationship with Him because they trust Him in faith. As Hebrew 11 makes clear, the Old Testament saints are in relationship with God because they responded trustingly to what God had revealed of Himself. Does that mean that Jesus was unnecessary for them? Not at all. As Hebrews 11 also makes clear, Jesus was the promised Messiah and the perfect sacrifice for all God's people who would repent and believe. Acts 10 tells the story of Cornelius, a God-fearing centurion who God spoke to through a dream, and then through Peter. And he ended up repenting and believing, trusting in God. Joshua 2 tells the story of Rahab, a pagan harlot who trusted the God of the Israelites. And as Hebrews 11 makes clear, it was accounted to her as faith. 2 Kings 5 tells the story of a pagan elite, Naaman, whose life was spared because he trusted the God of Israel. So what about those who have never heard? We know all men and women who do not know Jesus as Savior reside under God's judgment. But we also know that God saves those who call on Him in faith. God will glorify Himself and accomplish His purposes to call to Himself a people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. If you think it's not fair that some will perish under God's judgment, you need to rethink your definition of fair. Friend, we do not need a holy God to be fair with us. We need Him to be merciful. The only thing we deserve is His judgment. But He has been so kind to us in Christ. The Bible does not answer this question directly, but why does it matter? The issue for apologetics, those of you hearing my voice, is that you have heard the gospel. You have been given the good news of Jesus. If you are not a Christian, you need to know that you stand under God's judgment. But the good news is that God made a way through the giving of Himself to satisfy His wrath against you. What will you do with this good news? What will you do with Jesus? You should not presume God's forbearance, but ask for His mercy, repent, and believe. Christian, you are responsible for what you do with Jesus. As Romans 10 says, How will they call on Him of whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Are you telling your friends the good news about Jesus? Are you defending the faith and critiquing unbelief? Well, that's all for this session. Here's some recommended reading you may want to pause here and write it down. I really do encourage you to spend time to read at least one of these books that I've mentioned throughout these courses and to go back and watch the videos again and again to remember and remind yourself of the things we have studied together. Well, in our next session, we'll be looking at Christ and culture.
Thanks for joining us for UC University Apologetics. Stay safe. See you later. See you soon.